Applications to Derivatives, the Logistic Growth Model. The Logistic Growth Model is a mathematical model that looks at how things grow, how they change, and how big they can get. This is often used in biology and chemistry, and sometimes in business, but most applications have to do with biology. Logistic growth models all take on the same form. They have the form P of T equals L divided by 1 plus CE to the negative KT. P of T means that we're modeling some sort of population. What that population is will change from example to example. The other variables have distinct meanings in this type of model. So L, the number that's found on top of our model, is called the carrying capacity. Now, the carrying capacity of a logistic growth model tells you how big the population can grow if given a long time. All populations have a carrying capacity. This is determined by a lot of factors, such as resources, birth rates, death rates, things of that sort. So how big a population can grow is going to be determined by the resources available. K is your growth rate. So by changing K, it'll impact how quickly your model grows and reaches its carrying capacity. T is time. Time is going to be your independent variable. That's how we're going to study these models. We're going to look at how they vary over time. And C is a constant. This constant is a factor that's impacted by things such as food resources, birth rates, death rates, all those sorts of things. And it'll change from model to model depending on what you're looking at. Logistic growth models can be particularly important when you're studying how big and how quickly a population is changing. For example, if you're modeling the spread of a disease and you're using a logistic growth model, it'll help you predict how many people will be infected and how long it'll take until you reach that point. So let's look at a picture of what a logistic growth model will look like, which will help us understand how they function. Logistic growth models all have the same basic shape. They start off growing exponentially, but then things like scarcity of food or things of that sort kick in and it levels out how quickly your function is growing because eventually it will reach its carrying capacity L. So again, that's how big the population can get. At that point, it can't get any bigger given the resources. Notice that this graph starts off concave up, has an inflection point, and then becomes concave down. This inflection point is really important because if we look at the slopes of the tangent lines, we can see that they're increasing until this inflection point, and then they begin to decrease. So when we're at the inflection point, we're at the point where our function is growing most rapidly. And that can be important and useful in a lot of scenarios. It turns out that this inflection point always happens when we're at exactly half of the maximum population, L over two. And this point, this inflection point has a special name. This point is called the point of diminishing returns. So again, the inflection point is when P of T is growing most rapidly. And it happens at exactly half of the carrying capacity. So we'll note that down here. So if we know what the population is when we're growing most rapidly, we could use that to determine what the maximum population was going to be. So how do we go about finding out when this occurs? Well, a little bit of algebra will help us determine when this happens. But what's really important is that it happens at this inflection point because we can see how the growth rate is changing. So let's look at some examples of things we can determine using the logistic growth model. Example one, suppose a population can be modeled by P of T equals 200 divided by one plus 39 E to the negative 0.2 T, where P of T is in thousands of people and time T is in years since 2000. This is the typical setup of a logistic growth problem. There's typical questions that we often ask associated with this, and these are the four most common questions. First, 
what is the initial population of this model? So how big was our population when we started measuring this particular population? So the word initial should tip you off that we're considering what happened at time equals zero. So that means we want to know what the population was when time was equal to zero. So we're going to plug in a zero for t, and that's going to result in giving us an e to the zero power. Anything to the zero power is going to give you one. So that means we have 200 divided by one plus 39, which is 40. 200 divided by 40 is going to give you five. But remember, the population is in thousands. So here, that means my initial population was 5,000 people. So wherever this particular model is taking place, we started with 5,000 people in the year 2000. And again, the word initial tipped me off that I was looking at time equals zero. Part B, what is the carrying capacity of this model? So this question wants to know how big can this population get given the resources that are available to this population. Now remember, the resources are all factored into things like the constant C and the growth rate. So here, the carrying capacity of the model is the number that's on top. The number that's on top is 200, but remember this population is in thousands. So the carrying capacity of this particular model is 200,000 people. So wherever this particular model is happening, the most that it can sustain is 200,000 people. Now here's where things get a little more tricky. Part C wants to know, when is this population growing most rapidly? So remember, we said that it's gonna be growing most rapidly when we reach half of the carrying capacity. So remember, that means we need to take our population and set it equal to exactly half of the carrying capacity. So here, that would be 100. So I want to know, when does my model reach 100? So here we see that we're going to have to do a bit of algebra to solve. So first, I'm going to multiply this 1 plus 39e term up and divide the 100 down. So when I do that, I get 1 plus 39e to the negative 0.2t equals 200 divided by 100, which is just 2. Now I can subtract 1 from both sides, and I get 39e to the negative 0.2t equals 1, because I subtracted a 1 from both sides. I'm going to divide both sides by 39, so e to the negative 0.2t equals 1 over 39. Then I'm going to take the natural log of both sides. When I take the natural log on the left, it's going to cancel out the e term, so I have negative 0.2t equals the natural log of 1 over 39, which means that t is going to equal the natural log of 1 over 39, all divided by negative 0.2. So if I put that number into my calculator, I'm going to get that t equals 18.3, approximately. But remember, the time is measured in years since 2000, which means it's 18-ish years after the year 2000. So when this population is growing most rapidly, it's going to be during 2018. So I have to add that to my starting point. So we were able to use a little bit of algebra to solve for where that inflection point was. Similarly, we could take the second derivative and see where it equaled zero. But that's going to become really complicated really fast because we'll have to do multiple quotient rules and the algebra gets much more messy. Part D is very similar to Part C. It wants to know when this population will reach 150, which means instead of setting our population equal to 100, which was half the carrying capacity, we're going to set it equal to 150. And then we're going to repeat the process. So let's take a look at that. So I take 150 and I set it equal to my model, which is 200 over 1 plus 39e to the negative 0.2t. I'm going to multiply up 
the 1 plus 39e term, and I'm going to divide over the 150. So I get 1 plus 39e to the negative 0.2t equals 200 divided by 150. I'm going to simplify this fraction, and that's going to reduce down to 4 thirds. So now I can subtract a 1 from both sides, and I get 39e to the negative 0.2t equals 1 third, because 4 thirds minus 1 is 1 third. Now I need to divide both sides by 39. So I get e to the negative 0.2t equals 1 over 117. If I divide 1 third by 39, that 39 gets multiplied into the denominator. Now I want to take the natural log of both sides. And again, when I take the natural log of the e term, it's going to cancel out the e and leave me with the negative 0.2t. So negative 0.2t equals the natural log of 1 over 117. So that tells me that t equals the natural log of 1 over 117 divided by negative 0.2. So again, I can crunch this number in my calculator, and I get that this is approximately 23.8-ish years. So remember, time was measured since the year 2000. So this population will reach 150,000 people in 2023, 23 years after we'd started measuring. So these are some of the things we do with logistic growth models. But there's another application we have here. So let's take a look at another example. Example two. Sales projections often follow logistic growth curves. Suppose the table below tracks the sale of a new book since it was released and the data is logistic. So in the top row, we have T in months since the book was released. And in the second row, our dependent row, we have P sales in the 1000s. So that means in the first month, at month zero, before we hit the first month, we'd already sold 2000 books. Similarly, in the sixth month, we had sold 30,000 books. So what we want to do is we want to use this data in a meaningful way. And knowing that it's logistic, we can apply some of the things we know about logistic growth models to help us make predictions. So first, let's do part A. Determine the most likely place that this function has an inflection point. So we've looked before at how we can find inflection points and talk about the second derivative based on a table. Remember, we can find the concavity of the table by looking at how the average rates of change are changing themselves. So let's go ahead and compute a couple of the average rates of change here. So from here, from time equals zero to two, the change in y over change in x, four minus two divided by two minus zero is gonna give me two. Between the next two points, I have 12 minus four divided by four minus two. That's gonna give me four. 30 minus 12 is 18, divided by 2 is 9. 77 minus 30 is 47. 47 divided by 2 is 23.5. 107 minus 77 is 30. 30 divided by 2 is 15. And then finally, 120 minus 107 is 13. 13 divided by 2 is 6.5. So remember, if your average rates of change are increasing, that tells you that your function is concave up. So here, we notice the values 2, 4, 9, 23.5. Those are all increasing. So from time equals 0 to time equals 8, we have a concave up function. After that, however, we have 23.5, 15, 6.5. So those average rates of change are decreasing. And if the average rates of change are decreasing, that means your function is concave down. So from month 8 to month 12, our function is going to be concave down. If we're trying to figure out where we might have an inflection point, we're looking for where we change from increasing to decreasing. So for this particular model, this looks like it's going to happen in month eight. So the most likely place that we're going to have an inflection point is going to be 
T is approximately eight. So eight months after we released the book. Now, that part was the part where we applied the calculus. Now we do in a little analysis that's really, really powerful. So part B, we want to use our answer from part A to predict the maximum sales for this book. So how do we figure out what the maximum sales are going to be? Well, that's based on the fact that this is logistic. So remember, when you have a logistic growth model and you're at the inflection point, the population at that time is half of the carrying capacity. And the carrying capacity is the maximum population. So that means that the dependent value when T equals eight, which is 77, should be half of the carrying capacity, which will be the maximum. So by doubling that number, 77 times two, we can figure out what's predicted to be the maximum or the carrying capacity for this model. So that gives me 154. But remember, this is in thousands. So here I can either write it with the word thousand or I can write it out as a number. So 154,000. So I can predict how many I'll sell, 154,000, by using this model. So if I'm someone who is selling things, I can look at the trajectory of the rates at which I'm selling things. And as they're speeding up, the rates are speeding up, I know that I'm concave up. And when my sales rates start slowing down, I know I've hit that inflection point. And I can look at the sales at that time and use that to predict how many I will eventually sell. So prediction is one of the most powerful tools that we can use in calculus. And this is one example of how we could apply that.